Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Whosember. Today we're going to be doing uh, a bit of a review, a review of the Winter Time Paradox. Now this is an anthology book written by Dave Rudnan. Uh, he also wrote the Twelve Angels Weeping anthology book. So I figured I would do this one because, you know, winter time, it's all about stories set in winter. So, uh... I've been reading it oh, over the course of about a week and a bit. So, and uh, here we go. We're just going to go through every story. And uh, that's it. So, the first story is called He's Behind You. So, the Tenth Doctor has taken Rose to see a panto play about the Time Lords. Now, uh, the funny thing is that, you know, Rose is like, Well, shouldn't you be kind of upset they're making fun of the Time Lords? And the Doctor's like, Nah, not really. You know, I find it funny. Um, so, you know, they get in their seats and then the, a robot attendant is like, you know, we, we, we must see your tickets. And the doctor's like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And he takes out the second paper, shows it to the attendant. But um, because Rose apparently still has, this is very shortly after uh, the 10th Doctor and Rose started traveling together. Rose still has a bit of the, the time vortex energy on it and it kind of makes the paper malfunction. And it says that Rose is Dr. Rose Tyler, who is an expert on Time Lords. So, uh, one of the attendants says, Oh, wow, we, we have an expert on Time Lords here. Uh, would you both like to head backstage? And uh, Rose agrees to this. So, Rose and the Doctor are instantly teleported, and Rose, uh, they're teleported backstage, and Rose meets uh, Shara Be Betamax, who is playing the Hand of Meg. You can tell who she's supposed to be. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of stuff here that they mention and it's like, this is wrong, you know? Um, when eventually Rose is introduced as like, you know, the Time Lord uh, specialist, uh, Sharla's understudy changes. She changes and reveals she's an Auton. In fact, all the actors here, a lot of the crew, they're Auton. So this play was meant to be a trap for Time Lords. They were hoping that a Time Lord would see the play, come and visit, and then they would get the Time Lord. So the Doctor eventually teleports in. Um, they had just kept teleporting him into like uh, a closet. Uh, but eventually he teleports in um, and he tells Rose that, you know, like, oh, these... These autons, they've been pretending to be these actors for so long that it's kind of overwritten their innate programming. It's a thing where you pretend to be something for so long, you start to actually believe you are it. So he says, you know, they kind of have to do the show. So he gives Rose some lines, teleports her on the stage, puts her in the Time Lord outfit. And Rose says some lines and the, the autons, they're over, the programming is overwritten. And they just do the play. So eventually, uh, you know, the audience applauds, Rose, the Autons are all all well and good. And um, that's that's the story. You know, uh, the Autons are, of course, going to look for the, the actual humans. Um, and that's the story. Uh, at the end of the story, though, there's a man and woman in masks who are observing and watching. I had a theory on who these two were, and I'm so happy I was right because my theory was at a left field, but I can't believe my theory was right. The second story is Father of the Daleks. So the Eleventh Doctor and Davros meet for the first time on a planet where they have the best Christmas lights. So every so the Doctor has now been inviting Davros for the couple next couple Christmases to just meet and chat. You know, this also kind of explains why uh, the 11th Doctor didn't meet Davros in the show, which is a nice little thing to put in there. Because, yeah, he never met Davros. Um, he never met Davros. He didn't meet the Master on TV. So this was a way of them kind of plugging in that hole for Davros. So the next Christmas they meet, and the, the Doctor tells Davros how, you know, the word Christmas. You say Christmas, and someone... Everyone thinks of something different. It has a different meaning to everyone. But if you say the word Dalek, 
Everyone has the same meaning. It just means Dalek, hatred, destruction, fear, you know, all that stuff. And he's like, Davros, you can change that. And Davros says that, you know, if he did change them, they wouldn't be his children. What type of a father would he be? And I thought that was, that was a great response. Uh, so Davros is then asked by the Daleks to help them acquire new cloaking technology from the Krillitanes. The Krillitanes are those things from uh, the school reunion, the big bat things. So during the assault, Davros is warned by the Doctor to stop. When he doesn't, the Doctor then uses a mix of the Krillitanean tech and some Gallifreyan technology to blind the Daleks. Um, when they come back online, the Krillitanes and the Doctor are all gone. So, um... The Daleks tell Davros, you know, you have failed us. Uh, Davros and the Doctor meet for one more Christmas, and Davros tells the Doctor, you know what? You're right, something does need to change. Uh, hundreds of Daleks then show up, using some cloaking technology from Davros' own design. And uh, Davros is like, there, he, he's given the Daleks the Doctor. And the Doctor says, you know what? I'll let you all kill me. I won't do a dang thing. I'll let you kill me right now. But, you have to kill Davros first. And Davros is like, like they'll ever do that. Yeah, no, the Daleks do it. Because the Daleks, all they care about is just fulfilling their goal. They don't care what they gotta do to do it. They'll just fulfill the goal. So they go to shoot Davros, but he, of course, has a self-destruct protocol in there that if they try to attack him, they self-destruct. So all the Daleks explode, and Davros is a bit shaken, a bit bit hurt that the Daleks would do that to him, you know, but they're his children in the end and he still loves them and when they call him again for help in a certain time war, he is more than happy to help. And that is Father of the Daleks. So then we have Inflicting Christmas number three. Uh, oh my god, this name is weird. It's a very futuristic name. Adiyami Lawal. She is demonstrating her new invention, which allows people to create like their own hard light holograms. And she kind of demonstrates this by using, make using it to like you know make the room have Christmas decorations and all that. So the twelfth Doctor and Bill arrive at the convention that this is at, which is called We Create Futures. Uh, and three giant ice birds attack the convention. They all have Adayami's face on it. So they capture some civilians, and. Uh, And uh, Bill is one of the civilians to get, you know, captured. So uh, Bill meets the person responsible for this in like this big castle type thing. Uh, and it's Adiyami's son, Ebi. Now he's doing this because, uh, you know, his mom leaves him alone all the time. And uh, she actually used their house as part of her demonstration. And he ain't too happy about that. Um, so Bill talks him into, you know, turning off the holograms, you know, letting everyone go by saying, you know, yes, you and your mom fight, but you can, st you still have a mom. I don't. And, uh, I would have loved to talk to my mom about any problems I had, but you, and I can't, but you could, you and your mom still have a chance to make this right. Um, Adiyami, she shows up, everything's turned off. She apologizes to her son. He apologizes to her. That's the story. So episode four is for the girl who has everything. Now, this is the first one that uh, doesn't have the doctor in it. So in the Grey Archive, a unit, Osgood is searching for a Christmas present for her dad. This isn't the Black Archive. It's the Grey Archive. Uh, while she's doing that, a Santaran pod activates, and she's attacked by four malformed Santarans. Uh... One of them looks like Luke Rattigan. If you don't know who Luke Rattigan is, he's the traitor from the Santaran Stratagem two-parter with uh, the Tenth Doctor and Donna, and that's where Martha kind of joined them for a bit. That episode. Um, so she uses the equipment basically in the Black Archive to hold them off until Kate Stewart and the rest of Unit arrive. They take them down, and uh, Kate said uh, she she liked uh, uh, she thought Oscar did a good job. You know, you you held them off on your own. And uh, she's like, Osgood, I got an idea. How about you work with me? And that kind of explains why Osgood's with Kate. That's what this story is for. Uh, number five is Visiting Hours. So this is another story without the Doctor. So this has Rory. He's bringing Christmas dinner for River at um, 
her prison. Now, Amy isn't there because her own mother is sick. So Rory is there. He's taken to River Cell by uh, Shill, uh, who is the psychiatrist at the facility. And he wants to write a paper on River and become famous. You know, the paper on, you know, he knows how River Song ticks and all that. Uh, and he tries to get Rory to convince River to help him, but Rory just ignores that. Like, eh, no way. Uh, so shortly after they get to a river cell, the lights go out, and prisoner's cells open. It's a big malfunction. Everything is going chaos. Uh, Shill uses the security cameras, uh, and he finds out that a, a, ma a mad scientist named Rubel is at the control center. So it must be Rubel, and she must have taken control of everything, and she's causing chaos. So the three make their way to the um, to the control center and stop her. They uh, stop at the infirmary to get patched up, you know, take a bit of a breather. River and Rory have a bit of a fight about her choosing to be in prison instead of being with her family because, you know, River, she can get out whenever she wants, but she keeps choosing to stay in prison and not be with her family, and Rory ain't too happy about that. Rory tells Chill that, you know, if they live, I'll help you with your paper. Uh, Rory is about to be attacked by Rubel when they actually get there, so they get to there. Um, they uh, all start attacking Rubel, and Rory is about to get attacked, flung into the wall, but Chill stops her. He's like, no, don't do it, no, 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 no. Um, River shoots a panel, and everything turns back on, and uh, it's revealed that uh, Chill set this whole thing up to get Rory to help him. However, uh, Rory and uh, River, they kind of figured that out earlier, so they staged their fight earlier, and uh, they faked this whole thing. So Roy and River, they go back to her cell, and uh, they have some Christmas dinner. And about Rubel, it's revealed that Chill was controlling her um, using like an implant. So uh, after this whole debacle, Chill is confronted by those by that masked man and woman from the first story, and they ask him all about River Song. Number six is we will feed you to trees. Back with the doctor here. Wasn't that a name of a story, huh? So the seventh doctor arrives on a planet and he's almost instantly changed and, and sent as a sacrifice. So the people on this world, they send a sacrifice to the forest every year to hold back the winter, which they call the siege. Uh, so the woman taking the doctor uh, starts to feel guilty and has doubt about this practice. Um, ever since she's had to send her wife a couple years ago, which yeah, I'll do it. Uh, the doctor deduces that this is actually a colony planet in the 25th century. Uh, she ties the doctor up to a tree where a giant tree monster comes and takes the doctor away. So on the way back to her uh, village, she starts to think of all the people she's done this to, you know, and uh, she eventually feels bad about it. And, you know, she goes to help the doctor uh, on trying to find him. She finds a giant ship with those big tree things. Uh, so she goes to attack one of the ones holding the doctor and uh her axe is actually frozen in the air and uh and a voice comes over it says do they want a system check and the doctor's like yeah we want a system check turns out these trees were actually uh exosuits big exosuits these aren't actually big tree things they're exosuits and their job was to make this planet habitable for the residents who came on this ship years and years ago um so he sets everything up that, you know, these exosuits, they'll fix the forest and everything in about a year. And uh, some of the exosuits break up, break, uh, break apart, and they reveal that inside them is the people who were sacrificed. And one of them is, of course, that woman's mother. Uh, not mother, that woman's wife. Number seven is Christmas with the Plasmavores, another one without the doctor. So a couple called Harry and Madeline Plasmavore, their car has broken down. And they ask Catherine and her dad, Maurice, can we stay the night? Uh, Maurice agrees, even though Catherine I mean, is like, there's something off with these two. I don't know about this. Um, Harry and Madeline introduce their daughter, Emily. Uh, Catherine offers Emily some salt and vinegar uh, chips, but Emily refuses. Oh, no, no, no. They're instantly like, whoa, well, salt? Oh, no, no, she has to watch her salt intake. You know? And uh, Catherine then shows Emily her room, where uh, it is revealed once the door is closed, Emily tells her, I'm a plasmavore, and I'm going to suck the blood out of you and your father. So Catherine's like, ah, I see. So she takes a book, and she knocks Emily as hard as she can with it and runs away, but uh, she's captured by Madeline. 
So Emily reveals when she's tied up Catherine and her dad that, you know, her parents are actually slabs. If you don't know what plasmophores are, by the way, uh, they are the things from Smith and Jones, you know, like the old lady who is sucking the blood out of them. Yeah, Emily's one of those. So uh, she shows that the slab that was Henry now looks like Maurice. And Emily's going to take the form of Catherine. And Madeline will be taking the form of Catherine's dead mother. Um, but she needs a photo for the, you know, of the mom. So she tells Maurice, get me a photo. And Maurice says, okay, there's a photo in the shelf up there in the kitchen. So Emily goes to get it. She opens the box and Maurice tells her, it's salt. And it all falls on Madeline and, uh, not Madeline, sorry. It all falls on Emily and she dies. The slabs stop working. And look at that. The day is saved by the humans. So the, doc the uh, 11th doctor shows up right at the end and he's missed all the action. No. Oh, Number eight is called A Girl Called Doubt. Uh, so, uh, this planet has been overtaken by the Cybermen. And a resistance team is making its way through the city. And they come across a, uh, a broken Cyberman that's in front of a post office. And uh, the sergeant, he's going he's gonna to kill the Cyberman with a knife. And like, the knife is glowing blue because it's like, you know, it's made to kill Cybermen. Just as he's about to stab the Cyberman, it turns and it stops him. Oh no. Um, then a sound in the air causes a distraction. And that distraction allows a doubt, the main protagonist of the story, it allows her to push the Cyberman over. Now you're probably wondering, how the hell is she strong enough to push a Cyberman over? Well, yes. Uh, doubt then sees that there's a bunch of tiny silver creatures bearing into the ground. They're, they're Cybermites, says the scientist of the group. And uh, they repair Cybermen. Uh, but Doubt can somehow sense these cy Cybermites. She knows where they're going. How does she sense the Cybermites? Yes. So the team follow. And they use the big snowstorm that's happening as cover. They arrive at a big cathedral where there's many Cybermites repairing many Cybermen. That noise that, heard, that they heard earlier, it goes off again. It's the TARDIS and the fifth doctor steps out. And he says to everyone here. You're all in big trouble, except you, Doubt. Doubt is like, oh, why am I not in trouble? She turns and sees everyone's pointing their guns at her. What did she do? It turns out, Doubt is a Cyberman. She's a Cyberman that they were able to change and make think was one of them. So that way they could find the base of the Cybermites. Oh boy. And it's a big thing when Doubt has this crisis. She's like, wait, but I have a... I have a family. I have a mother and sisters who are waiting for me. And the doctor's like, no, it's all implanted. I'm sorry. And it's like a big, like, whoa moment, right? Like, geez, Louise. Uh, the sergeant's going to shoot her, but the doctor, he's like, keeps stopping. Like, nope, 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 no, you don't. Nope, 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 nope. Uh, but eventually, Doubt is shot by the scientist, which sucks. However, in her last few moments, Doubt uses the Cybermites to change the programming of the Cybermen. Uh, and what did she change them to do? To plant uh, croquets. Because in her implanted memories, she liked croquets. So it's a very sad ending. The next one is called A Perfect Christmas. This is another one without the Doctor. It has the Paternoster Gang as the main characters. So their Christmas is interrupted by a pickpocket. Uh, a pickpocket who um, they kind of save because she's being attacked by aliens. And they find that this pickpocket has a ruby which has the doctor's TARDIS in the ruby. So uh, Vastra deduces that this pickpocket, she must have stolen it from a time traveler who had the doctor's tar uh, stolen TARDIS key. So she plans to use the prototype of the telephone to call the doctor and tell him, hey, we have your TARDIS key. However, more aliens called the, the Sacristans, they keep it uh, attacking. Vastra has enough. And she's like, we're just being used to find the doctor. They want us to call him so that way they can attack the doctor. So she's like, we're just going to give up the pendant. Um, so they get back home and they find all their food's gone. The pickpocket took all their food. Uh, that pickpocket is revealed to be the masked girl from uh, that keeps showing up. Number 10 is called Missing Hibat Hibatius Frond. So Hibatius Frond was recently fired 
on Christmas for his failures. He was a detective, but he was always a crappy detective. So on the train ride home, he finds Missy on the train ride home, and he tells her all about how he was fired, and Missy gives him a gives him a drink from her flask, and he starts to get a bit more drunk, and he starts to tell her about a recent robbery of the, the crown jewels, you know? Uh, once they reach the next stop, you know, they see a man's being robbed, and Missy's like, Fran, this is your chance, go get him, you know? Uh, Fran goes after the robber, but ah, dang it, he gets away. Uh, the man who was robbed, however, is dead. Uh, and Missy, she keeps proding Fran, like, you know, look for clues, look for clues, look for clues. You can very much tell that this is all part of a uh, big plan by Missy. So Fran finds a puncture wound on the guy's neck, and inside his pockets, there's a red glove. Which, uh, is the same type of glove that was found, at, uh, to have stolen the jewels. Oh boy, so could this guy have stolen the jewels? So Fawn tells Missy that, uh, actually, you know, he's the reason the jewels were stolen. He was supposed to guard an alleyway, but he got hungry and went to get some fries. <laughs> what an idiot. Uh, Missy tells him that, hey, but if you solve this and get the jewels, they'll welcome you back. So they head to an address they found on the guy, on the dead body. And it's a bar, and you know, they all enter, and the, the barkeeper freaks out, and Fran goes after him, but the barkeep gives him the slip. Missy's like, hey, I, I got him. And, uh, well, Missy's like, I, but he he fell out the window. I must have startled him. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, I'm sure. Missy uses some really dodgy logic here to get Fran to go after his boss, making him think his boss is in cahoots. Frond is like, okay, how stupid do you think I am? I know, Missy, this is all part of you. This is all your plot. And Missy's like, yeah, it is me. And he's like, why'd you do all this? And she's like, well, I was bored. And then she kills both of them. And that's it. <laughs> Great. And then the final story. Oh, well, not the final story. The next story is a day to yourselves with the ninth doctor. So. The ninth doctor arrives at a postal office and he's like, he's here to stop an invasion because there's supposed to be an invasion. But he's like, oh no, it's already been dealt with. He's like, what? Yeah, a guy in a suit and spiky hair stopped it. Um, and he was left a card by the 10th doctor. Okay. So he then travels to uh, stop a cult. You know, he arrives at their base, but he's told by the people in the robes there. Oh yeah, that cult. Yeah, they left. They were, they were beaten. We're a new, we're a new order. Uh, we've just kind of taken their robes. Uh, but yeah, they, they, they were stopped by a guy before and he's like really and he's like yeah and uh those those new order people reveal that they have bow ties <laughs> so the 11th doctor is the guy who stopped the cult and he lives another card for the ninth doctor he tries to stop a uh an incident in a mine shaft only to be told it was dealt by a woman in a box so the 13th doctor and he gets another card finally he goes to a stamp convention because there's going to be a theft at this convention and this theft is so bad Leads to a war. However, he is stuck in the suite in the hotel. At, uh, at the convention. Because, you know, conventions have hotels. He's stuck in a suite by some guards. And like we were told by an a, a angry Scottish man that you must stay here because you need to rest. And he's going to stop whatever needs to be done. So the 12th doctor tells him that. And gives him a card. So the doctor eventually enters the TARDIS wardrobe having enough you know and uh i like a nice hint is that all the mirrors in the tardis wardrobe are broken so like once he regenerated into the ninth doctor he just broke everything and he tells the tardis you know i'm sorry for my anger and he cleans up the cleans up all the glass you know and he finds in there under the glass is a card from the war doctor and it's like, you know, I hope you feel better and all that type of stuff. And he, he looks at all the cards he's gotten and he goes, oh, well. And he starts to actually feel a bit better about himself. And then he heads to Earth. Now our final story is Paradox Lost. Sibling Same, which is the name of the masked man. He is in the timeline where the master is prime minister. The timeline where, of like, you know, the year that never was that the doctor undid. He's in that timeline before it is destroyed so the 13th doctor is has received a distress call that leads to the shadow proclamation headquarters however the shadow proclamation is like we did not send no uh, uh distress call 
We couldn't because a moon has appeared over our base and it has cut off all our defenses and cut off all our communication. So the doctor asked to investigate and, you know, uh, the shadow Pokemon is like, why do you want to do that? And the doctor's like, oh, well, I'm bored, you know. Actually, she's kind of nervous because she was sent a distress signal in the form of a paradox. And you don't send paradoxes because there's things that should not be done. So, uh, the architect says, okay, you can do go do that, but we're going to keep your TARDIS as collateral to ensure you uh, you cooperate. So, two guards are sent with the doctor. So, they are teleported onto the moon. However, instead of being, you know, a moon, it's like they're in a house. And the doctor uses this time to explain to the guards what paradoxes are. They're very dangerous. She explains the grandfather paradox. You know, you go to kill your grandfather so you're not born. But then if you're not born, you don't go back in time to kill your grandfather. So none of this happens, but it did happen. That whole type of stuff. Um, eventually, the doctor notices, like, on, like, the walls and the clocks and the wallpaper. She's like, there's no marks. It's too neat. So that tells her that none of this was actually made by people. This was all, like, artificially done. So eventually she opens a door and it's like this big kind of console. It's all dark inside. It's wrong, right? She's like, this is wrong. Uh, one of the guards shoots the other guard and takes off the helmet and reveals it's the masked woman from before. And then the masked man shows up in the thing. So the doctor reveals what this big console room is. This is the TARDIS. This is bits and pieces of the TARDIS that have been stitched together from abandoned timelines. For example, like the one where the master was president. Not president, but prime minister. So this is bits and pieces of the TARDIS from discarded timelines. So, uh, sibling same. Oh, the, uh, the girl is introduced as sibling different. Sibling same uh, activates the TARDIS, you know, because they want to get to the time war. Because the, by what the doctor did in stopping the time war, sending it um, in a painting and stopping, you know, putting the time war in a painting, you know, and uh, ending it the way the doctor did, screwed up these two. It screwed up their timelines. Now they are like living paradoxes. They, they aren't going to last long here. So they want to go back to the time war and put it and change it so that way they can be normal again. And the doctor's like, well, obviously, no, you can't do that. Uh, and obviously, this TARDIS isn't meant to work. It's stitched together of multiple bits of itself. It knows it's not supposed to happen because TARDISes are living things. The doctor realizes who sent the distress to It was this stitched together TARDIS is the one who sent her to the stress signal. And it's about to explode. So the doctor uh, is like, you know, this this isn't going to work, right? Um, sibling same. He feels guilty about what they've done. He wasn't really on board with this anyway. And sibling difference kind of going mad and lunatic. So he uses his paradox energy to stop the TARDIS, stop the paradox, everything. So uh, the doctor then offers sibling different the chance of a new life. You know, everything's fine now. You, you, you. you set in this timeline um you can go back to the shadow proclamation as the guard or i can offer you the chance to live a different life and uh sibling different takes the chance at a different life and that is it that is the winter time paradox overall i think uh, all the stories were pretty good uh however they're not really christmas like no, none of them really christmas isn't really Um, Christmas isn't really the main theme for a lot of it. A lot of them you can really take Christmas where it says or winter and replace that with literally anything else and the story operates the exact same. Very few stories need Christmas. Like the only one I could think that really needs Christmas or winter is the seventh Doctor one. And the one with Rory and River. Everything else, you can literally interchange winter, Christmas, all that stuff. Some of them don't even have it. 
right? It's just like a passing mention. So, yeah. In that, uh, so reading this as like a, oh, it's Christmas reading. Not really. Not really. Uh, but all the stories are pretty good. Some of them are do drag on a bit, I would say, where it's like you could have ended the story here, but it's the author, Dave Rudd, and he's operating. Uh, sorry, he's not operating, sorry. He is just kind of padding it out and giving you more. He's not even really padding, it's just he's giving you more detail. But his detail, it's like, do I need to know those details, you know? Um, but who were the siblings, by the way? Siblings, same, sibling, different. They were Faction Paradox. Deep, deep cut. I'm glad I was right. If you don't know who Faction Paradox are, Faction Paradox were a cult um, from the very early 90s, from the, not the early 90s, but the 90s Doctor Who books. Mainly in the 8th Doctor EDA book range. They were, they were an enemy of him. They were a cult. And they showed up a bit in the set, in a, uh, Virgin New Adventures, maybe a couple past Doctor Adventures here and there, but they were mainly villains for the 8th Doctor book range. And uh, ever since they were beaten, they've kind of disappeared. Um, and they're back. Dave Rutten brought them back for this. Which is crazy that Faction Paradox has come back. That proves Dave Rutten's a massive Doctor Who nerd that he brought back Faction Paradox, of all things. Crazy deep cut. Um, but overall, I enjoy pretty much all the stories in this. Um, I would give overall as like an overall read, it's an eight out of 10. I think it's a solid one. Um, so that is the winter time paradox. Um, if you've read it, what do you think? If you haven't, I would, I, I think it's worth a read. Um, there is an audiobook of it written by where I think every story is read by Sophie Aldrin. So there you go. Um, and that is the winter time paradox. And that is Whosember done. There was going to be more episodes of Whosember, but we're cutting it close here. So I figured I'd just end it off here. So this is the final episode of Whosember. And this will be the final video of mine uh, until after Christmas. So I want to wish you all a Merry Christmas. I hope you have a good time with friends, family, and all that. And I will see you all uh, after Christmas. So uh, enjoy.